with the first pick in the 2019 NBA Draft, the New Orleans Pelicans select Zion Williamson. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the Shot Clock Podcast. Today I'm joined by Mikkel Matthew from Courtside Radio. Mikkel, how you been up to lately? Man, um, pretty good. Uh, you know, just continuing to grind, figuring things out. Uh, I can't complain, to be honest. So, just pushing forward, man. Uh, so, kind of what I brought you on for was talk about the Black Lives Matter protests going on. Uh, you're out in L.A., and you've been pretty heavily involved with going to the protests and everything. Every day on your Instagram, we uh, see posts about it. So, what's some of your experiences that you've had that you can share with listeners? Man, just uh, – it's. I think it's a great thing. Uh, you feel the unity uh, when you're out there and about. Um, it's just so many different faces, so many different races, and – um, it's just a beautiful thing. And I think that we really need togetherness to grow as a, as a country and to grow as a world, you know, more love and just being there, just connecting with, uh, minds who are wanting, wanting, wanting to see change. Uh, a lot of people have dealt with so many things when it comes to racism that you want to fix it as best as we can. You know, it may not change exactly right now, but for the future, you know, for our kids and our grandkids and things like that, that people out there fight, people have had enough. And I think like this is the perfect time. Like, like you see that the protests are just ongoing and ongoing and, and it's a great thing. Like in 19, uh, when Martin Luther King was killed, they protest for six days. And in 1968, um, they had the, uh, the Civil Rights Act after those six days of protesting. And, I think that um, what's going on now in L.A., across the country, across the world, is going to be vital when it comes to that love and appreciation that should be shown to, you know, Black people because we offer so much. Uh, we do so much when it comes to fashion, uh, business, some of the most important figures, athletes, entertainers, uh, are African-Americans, are Black. So it's like, it's just we just want the love and just being out at the protest you hear a lot of people's stories like you get to talk to people and get to hear their stories about how they dealt with racism or police brutality um you know for myself i had three of my friends killed by police so i know that the, the issue is a serious thing and um just it just comes down to people having enough and people coming together uh, showing love and it's a part of history you know i am a media member so i want to make sure that i'm out there to get these images and things like that for the people to see because you know sometimes media doesn't give you anything you know they just show you the looting and is going on and i'm just trying to show people that it's more than that it's people from different colors different race different religions out there showing love for the cause and saying that all black lives matter and i totally agree with it uh, you mentioned listening to other people's stories uh, and what your story was. So what other stories have you heard from other people that's really kind of impacted you and made you even more motivated within this movement? Man, I, I met a lady. I was up there at the um, LAPD headquarters in downtown LA, and I actually had a media pass with one of my friends. So we were back there, you know, getting shots of the media, the police chief and things like that. And it was a woman and she had a sign. And the sign showed... Um, I think it was five, it was five different uh, guys on her sign. And I was like, hey, like, I'm curious, who are these people? And it was all of her family members killed by police officers. And none of the police were uh, charged or convicted. So she was out there with just so much anger and, like, energy. And, you know, she came to tears because, you know, she's like, man, when are we going to fix this problem? And, like, just her story alone let me know that, you know, to go along with my story uh, of the friends that I lost to uh, police brutality is that, man, we can't, we can't give up. Like, we have to keep this fight going. The only way change can truly happen is if people step up and step out, and we can't stop. And I just feel that we have to be relentless in this battle and 
it's the only way for growth. You know what I'm saying? Like, I truly understand all lives matter because all lives matter do. And for the people who say that, I'm like, of course, everyone agrees with that. But if we can solve the Black Lives Matters issue, it makes it that much easier for everyone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up with like making Black Lives Matter and then it's equal for everyone because I feel like that's what a lot of people don't get, especially from being somewhere in Indiana where it kind of has Southern racist tendencies. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of the problem here is people are always like, all lives matter. Why are they only prioritizing, prioritizing Black Lives Matter? Well, it's because everyone's going out there and so many black people are dying every day from police and so many other people. It's just racist injustice. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's why I'm glad that you brought that up. So, uh, what's how, like, has anyone said anything racist to you where it's kind of really brought to light that, wow, racism is like still such a great, like still such a very important thing in society and how people still use it against us? No, yeah, just, just, I can remember a situation like being in college and, um, I remember being pulled over by, like by two officers in two different cars. And I'm like, what did I do? So they pulled me over and the, uh, the officer asked me, what, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing in this area? And I was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, are you serious? Like, what am I doing in this area? Like, this is a college. Like, I go, like, I'm a student here. And I told him, like, I'm actually a student here at this university. And he was like, he was like, okay, I see your ID. So I give him my driver's license. Like, here you go. He's like, no, let me see your campus ID. So clearly he didn't believe I was a student in that area and I showed him and he walked to his car, talked to like his uh, partner. And then we came back and said, all right, we're going to give you a ticket for tinted windows. And I was just like, bro, I know that wasn't the reason why I was pulled over. You probably didn't think that I went here. So it just, it lets you know that it's still there. Uh, the whole white privilege thing is, is still there. And it's just something that has to be dealt with now. And what I love about this generation um, I don't know how old you are, but out here, like, you see so many young uh, white faces um, that's leading the charge, and it's going to take that type of effort for things to actually change because, like, I know you're in Indiana, so I know it's much different, but out here it's so diverse. Like, one of my show co-hosts is a white Jewish kid, you know what I'm saying, from Beverly Hills, and I'm a yeah. black guy from South Central. So it's like the diversity is there, and we just want to make sure that we – you know, stay connected and that we need all help. You know what I'm saying? And like, I, I talked to my guy, uh, co-host Alex, that if he's in a situation, I'm going to be here for him. And I know that he uh, sends the same energy my way. And that's how I think it should be. Yeah. So you mentioned a lot of white faces leading the charge. So is, have you ever like had any conversation with white people that have been like heavily a part of the whole Black Lives Matter protest or? Have you kind no, of? Oh, yeah. A few of them, um, I can't remember the name of the group, but they were working along with the Black Lives Matter uh, Los Angeles group to help put together the, um, the, the YG event where he shot his video and then they had like a few speakers. But yeah, so because they're part of it, they're like, man, I work with these faces. I know these people who are good people who are taking care of business and I want to support them. You know what I'm saying? Like, think about it like, we, we talk sports. When you look at a lot of the, the big athletes, they're, you know, they're African-Americans and they're not bad guys. Like you have someone like LeBron who's really trying to make a difference out there that you have to respect and love. And it's for you to look at other, you know, blacks or African-Americans and think that, oh, you know, but there's this bad group of them that makes mistakes. And that's who we really don't, you know, rock with uh to that point there's a bad group out of every race you know what i'm saying and that just is what it is but it's just it's just great just to have those those white figures there who have more of the power when it comes to the, the different industries and their voice adds that much more you know what i'm saying like when you see these images and you see so many white faces, it gives you that much more of a power compared to when you looked at the 60s and you saw most of those protests and it was mostly all blacks leading the charge. So it just gives, it gives uh, the system a whole different type of challenge. One thing I thought was really interesting from the pictures and shots you got up was, the, was a couple of days ago, whenever the, 
whenever uh, the Pride Parades came out and they helped protest with you guys too. I thought that was really interesting. So what kind of, what was that experience like for you to see like that unity from even multiple sexualities and multiple races? No, it was, it was really dope uh, because we were there to support uh, black trans lives. And I was able to learn there from talking to different like uh, trans people about like their health care, like in certain states, like in California and like LA is kind of okay as far as health care, but in other like smaller states, like they can't, they can't get the health care that they need because they are trans. So it's like, we, it's like, we just showing that the fight is for, for everyone. Like when we say black lives matter, it's not just heterosexual blacks. It's not just black men. It's not just black women. It's every type of black, whether you're gay, whether you're trans, whether you're bi, queer, it's like, it's, it's just a unity of togetherness. And like that, like that event, it was just so much love in the, in the air that it was just an energy that was like so crazy to be around and how they combined everything together. Like it makes it very impactful because that community deals with their own battles and the black community deals with their own battles. And for them to come together to do events like that makes that much more of an impact. So I want to go a little bit into your past, like going all the way back to being a kid. So, um, kind of what was your first experience with racism as a young kid man to be honest i really didn't have to do because i me coming from south central i mostly was around um like blacks and hispanics like that's that's the main thing i had like some asians uh that went i went to school with but not not really whites so most of it i would just you know see on tv or like hear from other like people's stories or family members. It wasn't until I got to college to where I really was the minority, stepping in the classrooms where I'm like the only black face there. And like pretty much when I got, I'll say like probably 17 or 18 is when like I was pulled over by the college. Like, so when I started driving, I started to get pulled over and like I'm driving a Honda Civic. I'm like, what am I going to do in a Honda Civic? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and just getting pulled over and you know, I'm just like, damn, so this is what, you know, my uncles and older cousins would talk to me about, about driving while black. And just like being at, at different parties, like, you know, frat parties, sorority parties, where it'd be a blend of the crowd, black and white. But then like, damn, I get in trouble and I'm kicked out of this area. And it's like, it was me and like the group of the white friends I was with that were like making noise and being crazy. But it's me that's like, hey, we need you to get out of this city or, you know, if we see you again tonight, you're going to jail type of things that really like, oh, damn, like this is really real. You know, well, California is so diverse that it's like you can hang with so many of these different groups, you know, but there's still that that prejudice and sometimes that, that racism that comes out in like the smallest of situations. Um, so kind of whenever I look at these protests and everything going on with the George Floyd issue. Uh, I mean, it seems like a lot of this is going to go down in history as like one of the biggest um, activist protests in the world. Because, I mean, we look back at Martin Luther King, it was not as many people were walking with him, but it was kind of a big innovator. And mm -hmm. I feel like this is kind of a big innovation for the world to go forward. So what's your thought on like the standpoint of where this may end up in history? I think this can really make a huge change. Just the fact, if you look at like uh, MLK, like he had his movement, but at the same time you had um, uh, Malcolm X and uh, Elijah Muhammad with the uh, Muslims movement. So it was kind of two different, two different draws when it came to it. But now it's just like, it's just all one. Like everybody's together on this. And it's like, this is what we're attacking. We're moving together. And I think that just makes it so much more powerful. Um bringing up Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. So what kind of impact did they have on your life going forward? No, they just, man, they just, from reading, you know, like things from them, uh, watching videos, interviews from them, it just lets you know that a, a black man can be powerful with more than just making music, being a, being a great athlete, that you can, you can be intellectual, you can use your words, you can pull groups of people together and, like they're a big influence on me. Like in my, my room, I have a picture of those two, um, like right next to my computer desk. So 
I try to to learn as much as possible from them because I feel that they did it the right way. Not everyone can be a, a great athlete. Not everyone can be a great actor or artist. So you can do it another way, and they they showed that way. Um. So one thing I kind of want to make a trend is I discussed last week with Josh when I had him on was what the N word meant to him, like when it's used against him or even used like to be friendly with him from another white person. So what, what's your thoughts on the N word? Because I know LA is so much more diverse than what Indiana is and especially where I live in Indiana. So what's your thoughts on it? Man, when it comes to the N word, um, from the older generation, you know, being a black person, we, you know, we know the history of it and we're told it all the time. And should it be used? No, to be honest, it shouldn't be. But I just think growing up in this hip hop culture, it just became a part of just, you know, the way that we live. It's like the way that we communicate to our friends and stuff like that. And it's, it's in the music that we hear every day, you know what I'm saying? And it's, it's just a part of us. Um, so like, I'm not comfortable sometimes when other races use it, but I understand that they listen to this music. They grew up in the, the same type of culture, you know, when it comes to like Hispanic people. Um, it's hard for me to get comfortable when white people try to use it because it's just like, it's so weird, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like people that use the, the B word to women, like that's something that I'm not like comfortable with because I'm just like, that's, it's just a weird feeling. So um, I understand what, you know, what the word uh, is. And, you know, I, I, for someone like myself, who, you know, is an inner city kid from South Central, that, you know, it's a part of our vocabulary, but I'm trying my best to minimize it, you know, the more I deal with these bigger names and people in the industry. And, you know, but it's tough because, like I said, you hear it every day through our music. Uh, I still have my friends that I grew up with that are, still you know entrenched into the culture even deeper than i am but man i don't you know i don't get offended to like to the word unless it's used with the er of course because then that's when i know that it's really uh, a hateful term and it's just you know it's just the way that you, you like like that you're using it do i think that it should only be a a black thing because we kind of took that word and stripped the negative uh notation of it and made it something of to, to, to be cool and just to belong to us. So that's what I feel about it. But I know that some other races through the music, being in that culture, they kind of pick it up. And that's just, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to change it. It's go, I think it's going to be here forever. I don't think it's ever going to be a time where that word just disappears because it's some people that's going to use hate towards blacks and they're going to use the, uh, the ER. And then it's people that are going to make music and talk that's going to just use it with the soft A and that's just... It is what it is. Yeah. Um, so you brought up hip hop, the impact of how the how the use of the N-word in hip hop has kind of affected today. Um, another thing is, like, I noticed with a lot of these celebrities from, like, the other day, Jimmy Fallon was in trouble for doing a blackface skit. Mm -hmm. So what what's your thought? Like, in your opinion, is it easy for you to forgive those type of guys that do the blackface skit or use any type of racial words in a skit or anything that are famous celebrities today or no? It's, it's just a context and then it's who the person is. I think for those um, celebrities, they should, you, you should know better. So you should know what blackface meant. So try to stay away from it as much as possible. Um, but some people know how to use it in a, you know, comedic way. Like you look at Robert Downey Jr. and Tropical Thunder, you know what I'm saying? Like, he was you like you understood what he was doing but like when you take it too far like these guys should know better like it's too much history for it. people have no excuse there's the internet these days you can go and look up and say what's you know what's going too far and what's not going too far and um you know you forgive to certain certain characters because you know that they're not really about that that type of life and they're supportive of black people in the culture but i just think before you do anything out for everybody to see, you know, look it up. You know what I'm saying? Certain things black people don't want to do to offend uh, Mexican Americans or to offend white Americans or to offend Asian Americans. So you just have to know what's going too far and what's, you know, just pushing the line. Um, so I want to bring a little bit of light to things. Uh, you're big into the NBA. Uh, that's what Courtside Radio is kind of about. It's talking about NBA and 
So a little bit about what's going on. I'm sure you know a lot of it, but so Kyrie, the statement he made mm-hmm. yesterday in the Nets group chat about making his own league, kind yeah. of what was your thoughts on that? Do you think that's true or not? I just – I see what he's trying to get to, but I just don't think that it's going to be possible. Like the NBA is too big. Think about it, the NBA had to defeat the ABA to go on, and now they're the NBA – part of one of the biggest, you know, sports in the world with basketball and it's not going anywhere. Uh, you know, Kyrie just has to know that it's not going anywhere and just find a way to communicate with like Adam Silver is a great commissioner. He seems like he's willing to listen and take a stand and they just really need to sit down and and talk to him that way. But creating a whole entire league, you're going to look like, um, LeVar Ball, and you see how that league flopped. And, you yeah. know, you just don't want to deal with that. You look at the XFL, Vince McMahon trying to make that happen. So you can't challenge these power leagues. You just have to use your power as a star athlete and a star brand to sit down with these people in charge. Yeah, um, and our thing is with Kyrie, I mean, he's kind of leading the charge on players possibly sitting out of games that are completely healthy but don't want to play – due to the racial injustice, injustice. So what's your thoughts on them wanting to sit out? Do you think it's the right move or do you think it's whatever? So for me, I'm torn because I'm such a huge basketball fan. I'm such a huge Laker fan. I'm like, damn it, yeah. why don't we have a chance to get another ring? All this craziness happens. So I'm torn because I want to see them play. I want them to finish out the season. Um, I want to see that Clipper-Laker uh, conference finals matchup. I want to see what Giannis is going to do and things like that. But then with me being a black man, I'm kind of like, if we play sports and basketball is going on, it takes so much attention away from the movement because a lot of those people who are out at these protests showing up to talk to the LAPD and these different uh, people in charge, they're going to like, damn, like it's, it's, I, I can go watch four basketball games today. And it's just kind of – it kind of brings that challenge of bringing, like, what Kyrie is saying, like, a distraction. So, uh, looking at it that way, I'm kind of like, okay, so I'm probably, like, 55, 45 of not bringing the season back just because it's just going to be crazy. And it's not even thinking about COVID and injustice. Just thinking about these guys having to play to finish the season out, go into October – a team plays into the championship, two teams, then you pretty much get only like a month and a half off to come back and have to play NBA basketball again. I just think that it's like their bodies won't be able to take that. And with this time off, if you maybe you start the next season in December, you just cancel this season, you start the next one in December, the guys can really go out there and do more when it comes to um, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement. And then they can get their bodies as healthy as possible and trying to defeat this COVID thing. And then once December comes bam, we're ready to see the best basketball that we can see. So that's why I'm leaning a little bit more on just man canceling the season. Yeah. So I looked at it and I was like thinking whenever they first announced bringing back the season, I thought you could either go two ways. You could do kind of like the, uh, like what they do for March Madness, they do one game, whoever wins moves on. I thought yeah. that could be a perfect solution because it gives them enough time where once the season's over, they get all this rest to kind of get ready for the next season. Because, mm-hmm. I mean, their bodies aren't, aren't going to be in the greatest of shape with four months off of the season already. True. So or I looked at it like they could do five games because, I mean, it's just you take away those two games. Those two games are just like extra heat out onto the fire. So – yeah, How about that could be two solutions. But yeah, looking at it, I'm a huge Lakers fan too, and seeing oh. Avery Bradley and Dwight Howard are thinking of sitting out. Yeah, I was kind of, I was kind of like, oh no, this can't happen. Dwight was having <laughs> an amazing season. Hey, hey, for real, I'm like, oh, I gotta be our guys. I want to sit out, man. We need all the help we can get, man, to beat this Clipper team. Uh, but yeah, like I was thinking about the March Madness idea. But I just think the NBA guys are divas. LeBron does not want to play one game, and some player just gets catches on fire from the other team, and he's eliminated. So I know that they will be uh, against that. I love the uh, the five game first round because it's the first round of the playoffs. Like I know, you know, it's, it's just the first round, and the best teams are going to win, are usually yeah. win the series no matter what. But if, for the NBA, it's all a money thing. You know, they want to get every dime they can get, and. It's so many things like in the CBA that has to be done that 
the players also need to play these games because they need those those dollars as well because not every player is Kyrie with a big contract and a shoe deal. So it's it's going to be very interesting, but my gut feeling is that the season is going to come back and be played. I believe the White's going to play. I believe Avery Bradley's going to play. Kyrie wasn't playing anyway. Yeah. So he, he was for him, game. it's 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 really nothing. But yeah, um, this is the best time to experiment because it's such a unique situation. So I, I'm just not sure exactly how it's going to go through. But man, it's going to be exciting. Yeah. No I I think uh, watching the if they were going to do the 16 seed like regardless of conference matchup, I think that would have been really interesting. Yeah. Because I guarantee out of nowhere we'd have, we would have seen the Lakers versus Clippers finals. Yeah. I mean, that would have been destined to happen. But so what's your thoughts on how the Lakers and Clippers stack up against each other? When it comes to the Lakers and Clippers, it comes down to Anthony Davis. He's the, he's the guy that the Clippers have nothing to deal with him. Like that guy is a – Big time player, uh, you know LeBron is great. Of course, he's LeBron, one of the greatest players of all time. But to deal with Kawhi in a seven game series is tough, you know. And and you got Paul George can be thrown at him. You can get some some defense from Patrick Beverly to you know to give him a little feisty defender here and there. But for Anthony Davis, they have nothing that can handle that. And you know, with Anthony Davis, he would have to be the guy to dominate that series. We would need a guy like Avery Bradley, like the last time he played the Clippers, they won 21 points, which were huge, you know. So we would need guys like that to step up because I think the Clippers are going to be that much better in the playoffs because the game slows down, which fits the pick and roll with Lou Will and Montrez, which fits what Kawhi wants to do. And, man, it's going to, you're going to have to have some legendary performances from AD and LeBron to make it happen, but – Damn it, that's why we brought them together. That's what Kobe and Shaq did to bring the Lakers three straight. And, you know, that's the expectation for Lakers fan because we hungry for it. Yeah. We haven't won since uh, 2010. So it's like make it any means necessary, make it happen. I, I honestly, in my opinion, I got the Lakers going to like six games against the Clippers. One, because if PG ends up playing the full series, it's probably over for the Clippers because of the chemistry going on. Because mm -hmm. Kawhi and PG have only played like 18 games together. Yeah. So, I mean, in LeBron and AD, they've played like what already 50 plus games together. So yep. that kind of way off, I think that's leaning more towards the Lakers side. And already we've seen like chemistry issues between the late or between the Clippers side too. Yeah. So I think, I think it's gonna be a wild series looking back at that, but um, looking at, so your standpoint, you brought, you brought up a uh, Shaq and Kobe going for a three Pete. Mm -hmm. Um, I know not all of us are probably expecting AD and LeBron not to get a not to go for three in a row, maybe not even two in a row. Mm -hmm. So where do you look at LeBron year 17, 35 years old? Where do you see his standpoint going in the future? No, I just think that he wants to try to win as quick as possible because, you know, father time is undefeated. You know, before Kobe went down, he was playing amazing ball. And then, bam, his Achilles go out. So you just want to try to – that's why LeBron is really fighting to play this season because he's like, I, you, you never know. And I know he's like, you know, I always tell people he is the uh, the greatest athlete to ever play basketball. And that's why he can be 35 in his 17th year doing what he's doing. But you just never know how your body can react as you get older. And he just has to make it happen now. You know what I'm saying? So if you can play this season out and go get this ring, you have to. Because for LeBron James, if he doesn't win a championship, with the Lakers, it would not be a good thing for his career. You know, he would be the only uh, big-time name other than Elgin Baylor who actually won one, even though he was he retired, like, right before the season. But he would be – LeBron would be the only guy to be this big name to not win with the Lakers, and he knows that he can't have that on his resume. Yeah, so I want to bring up – so more than just the Lakers, we got, like, tons of other teams, like the Rockets running the small ball lineup. The Nuggets, I, they're a pretty possible big threat in the West, especially yep. with Jokic losing a bunch of weight. I yeah. think that may benefit them or at the same time kind of cost them a little bit defensively with mm -hmm. this size now. But um, so what teams do you see as like a big threat coming up to these other three teams? I see some – like some teams that could surprise. I'm really scared as a Laker fan of Portland because they're going to be healthy. Like you get – you know, they got – 
they're going to get Nurchik back. Zach Collins, Carmelo was looking good. So it's just like, and it's Dame. Dame can get hot and do some amazing things. So I'm really scared of that guy. But as far as the West, like true contenders, the Rockets, because this pace of play that we may have, like usually around this time, James Harden, he gets burnt out, you know, the playoff times, and they start, start shooting terrible. But now he has all this rest. He, he got his body in shape. And then I just know how hungry, um, you know, Russ is. Like, I've, I've been able to uh, catch him, like, working out, you know, because, you know, we went to high school together and played ball. So I know that he's, like, in great shape and been really working on his game. And uh, I know the Rockets are just ready to make this push because those are two guys that need championships on their resume. So I know that they're going to be ready. So that team on the West and on the East, um, man, Toronto, the, the defending champs, they have so many athletes. Uh, they just played there last year, won a championship. Uh, Pascal was like, he took another step in his game. You still got Mark Gasol, you got Kyle Lowry and – Man, I just think that people can't overlook Toronto. Like, Toronto is – oh, they're, they're so scary. Like, when they played the Lakers earlier in the season, they beat us. I was like, who the hell are these athletes? I'll have no idea who they are. And that carries over into the playoffs where defense is a premium. And I just think that Toronto I – wouldn't, I wouldn't even be surprised if they – you know, if Giannis didn't improve and didn't make a push, you know, with his game, that Toronto can get them. And I hate it. Because this team, I always tell people, they have a chance. They have a chance. Philadelphia, if they yeah. can hear this, you guys can win if Ben Simmons just actually shoots jump shots and make it a, a, a consistent thing that people have to guard. You have Embiid, the best center in the game. Um, you have Tobias. Like, they have the pieces to win, too, so they can be a surprise. So those would be the teams I think that can surprise. Houston, Portland, uh, Philly, and Toronto. Yeah. Uh, so you brought up Toronto. Looking back, so at the beginning of the season, do you think they would have been as good as they are now? No, nah, I, I really I, – I wasn't sure. I didn't think Siakam would take this next step. Um, I didn't know that, like, they would find these other athletes and Hollis Jefferson and Chris Brochere. And, I, like, I just didn't think that it would work. But it just shows you how good uh, their head coach is. And it just shows you that – they really found something, whether they had Kawhi or not, they found something that we're going to have all these athletes. We're going to focus on the defense and, and Siakam is going to be amazing. Kyle Lowry has, who has always been solid, you know, at one year, I think they were the number one seed with him and DeMar. So it's like, they just have a guy in Siakam that took that step and Marcus saw uh, his impact on the defense at end is like so underrated. Uh, that people don't look at, and he just makes that difference. And you got Serge Ibaka. They just have a really good team yeah. together, and it just I, – I was dumb for not believing in them, um, just like a lot of other, uh, like, basketball analysts and reporters. But they they proved a lot of us wrong. Drake was right. Drake yeah. know more than we do when it comes to basketball, <laughs> I guess. So we got to trust in Drake. I think what's insane about it is you look back and it's like, all these guys are built up out of the G League almost, like Fred yeah. Van Vliet, uh, OG Ananobi. I think he played a little bit in the G League. Yeah, I mean, OG so many of these great guys you've got. Even Marcus Saul, he got traded for his brother early in his career, so he wasn't expected to be much. Now he's a yeah. defending champion, mm -hmm. and he's a big X factor in what helped them win. I, that's insane to me is how well that team was built up. But uh, another thing you brought up was what Russell Westbrook. Uh, you said you went to high school and played ball with him, right? Yeah, so we both attended Losinger High School. So I've been on him since I was about the eighth grade and through basketball. And, uh, yeah, we played at the same high school together. So, um, yeah, I, so I just kept that communication, you know, as friends and stuff. So, yeah, it's love there, man. So have you ever been able to, like, has he ever got you tickets or anything to go to one of his games? Because I feel like that would be amazing, man. Yeah, we went – I went to Oklahoma City to watch them play uh, Kyrie and then, you know, was able to – he, like, introduced me to Kyrie and some of the Celtic players. And just, like, uh, showing up to, like, the open runs at UCLA, I show up to those runs and, like, check out the guys. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool, man. But uh, so, real quick, I know you got the Lakers going for the championship. Yeah. But uh, 
who do you got them meeting in the Eastern Conference Finals? Because I know that we got the Bucks and the Raptors and all of them. So who do you got going there? Man, I want to say Toronto just because they've been there, done that, and they took that step. But I just think that Giannis, like he felt that embarrassment of being up 2-0, everybody saying you're about to go to the championship and falling apart that I think that he's going to, man, make a strong push. Like I think he's going to have a Shaq type of performance in the Eastern Conference that gets them all the way to the final. So uh, I got – at the beginning of the season, I had Lakers Philly, but clearly I was like Philly disappointing me. And they can make a run, but I just think that Giannis and those guys are playing like you know they had the best record. I know they, I think they lost their last three games, but I think the reset kind of helped them out just to kind of like gather themselves together because it looks like they were shooting for probably seventy wins or close to it. Now they kind of get to regroup, and you know you just never know what Giannis is doing. Like he may come back and like, oh my God, this dude is making. 35 foot three pointers, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Added to his game with this with this extra time, man. I think that Milwaukee's gonna make it. Um, and uh, you brought up Philly, so real quick about that. What do you think they're gonna need to make a trade to be successful in the future, or do you think Joel and Ben Simmons will work out? They can work. I just think that the, their coaching is Brett Brown is not coaching them right. I think they're coaching too much around Embiid, which is like taken away from Ben Simmons' ben, strength. Yeah. I think they need to really – I don't get why they don't just go look at Showtime Lakers and see that this was a magic-led team. It was push, push, push. Damn it, the team stopped us, and now we played through Embiid. So I think if they play to Ben Simmons' strength, that Embiid is so good that the touches that he gets, he can make the best out of him. They need to tell him to stay away from the three-point line because you're big. Like, go down there and dominate get to the free throw line, get the other bigs and foul trouble, you can impact the game. So I just think that if they have a coaching change and that new regime realizes we have to play through this, that they can make that push. So I wouldn't trade right away. Um, It doesn't seem like they have too much beef or anything like that. So I would just try to figure it out, you know? Um, Another thing with the 76ers is Al Horford. Like, prior to the year before this with the Celtics, I mean, he was looking amazing. He was a really great X factor for the team. Mm. But for the 76ers, uh, you go on NBA Twitter and everybody slander him on there every other week. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's your yeah. thoughts on Al Horford? I just think that they just built that team. Like, if you brought him in, it should have been like, hey, we're going to need you to be our the guy off the bench because – we want to play with some some spacing and pace just so we can maximize Embiid, maximize Simmons, and even Tobias Harris needing that space to work. So I just think that them trying to play um, Embiid and Horford together, it would have worked in the early 2000s, kind of like um, Duncan and Robinson. But now in today's game, it's like you don't need that. Like teams are just going to run you. And if they were to use him off the bench, he would look so much better because MB wouldn't be in his way. All right, man. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. We're about out of time. So, but I appreciate you for coming on, talking everything with the protests going on, talking NBA. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm glad you came on. Um, Go, if you want to, you can go help plug your show, plug your Instagram and everything if you want to. So, uh, hey, yes, sir. Hey, Keep doing good work, man. I, I'm watching it, and I, I'm seeing the growth. You're doing a good job, man. Thank but, you. Uh, Mike Hill to PG. You can find me on Instagram, uh, Twitter. Mike Hill Matthew on uh, Facebook as well. Last name M-A-T-H-I-U. First name M-Y-K-E-L-L. Courtside Radio. You can tune in through uh, the Good News Radio app. Um, that's I'm a, one of the uh, top admin for that company, the Good News Radio. So we have – Good News Radio, the Good News Sports, so you can check out my show, Courtside Radio, with the starting five. And then also uh, Don't At Me with uh, Michael and Alex. Uh, it's a YouTube show that we have over 35 episodes. Uh, Rob Parker, Chris Boussard were, were guests. Um, Clipper Darrell, um, who else? Paul Pierce, uh, a, f- a few names. So I'm just trying to uh, work on every end, man. So I thank you for the, you know, the opportunity to uh, join your platform. And like I said, once again, you're doing a great job, man. Keep it up. Thank you. All right. Uh, But it's been great having you on. Uh, If you guys want to check out The Shot Clock, follow us on Instagram at The Shot Clock Pod. Uh, And we'll see you guys later.